Welcome everyone on this beautiful Sunday evening. My name is Christy Franson, Chair of the Claremont Mormon Studies Council at Claremont Graduate University in Southern California and Vice Chair of the Howard W. Hunter Foundation, bringing you another by Study and Faith Fireside. This one is very special. On August 20th, just a month ago, Kate Holbrook died after a decade-long battle with a rare cancer of the eye, leaving this world far, far too soon, but leaving all of us in the church and beyond far richer and better for having had her in our lives. It is possible that many of you have never heard of Kate Holbrook, her extraordinary, beautiful life, and the important work she did in church history. So let me tell you a few things. Kate was a pioneer, the very first historian hired by the church with the mandate to focus on the role of women in our history. There could not have been a better pioneer than Kate. In the short decade that she was there, she published prolifically. Her major works include At the Pulpit, a collection of discourses given by women from the past 185 years, Women and Mormonism, a volume co-edited with our own Matthew Bowman, The First 50 Years of Relief Society, a treasure trove of key primary source documents, and she was working on a history of the young women at the time of her death. And that is in addition to scores of articles and essays written and published. Kate was busy. And the fact is, she was just beginning what everyone hoped and expected would be a long productive career of research and writing and collaborating and sharing. She didn't live long enough to achieve the renown she deserves in the wider membership of the church. But the life she lived and the work she did will be with us forever. And those of us who love her are left to make sure she is never forgotten. That's what tonight is all about. But there's something else. Kate devoted her life to a quiet ministry of noticing and then helping in every way she could anyone in need. That consecrated ministry continues even after her death. At Kate's request, a scholarship fund has been established in Kate's honor to help primary caregivers of young children who are pursuing graduate work in the humanities. Kate herself was the recipient of unsolicited financial assistance from good people who saw her potential and wanted to help make her burden a little lighter. We invite all of you listening tonight to give what you can to the Kate Holbrook Endowed Scholarship Fund at Brigham Young University. The link will be in the chat box and was also included in the email announcement that you received for this fireside. There is nothing that would make Kate and her family happier than your support of this. One last reminder before we begin. If you have not already done so, please sign up on our email list so that you will know about future firesides and other Mormon studies events. You'll find the link also in the chat box on our CGU Mormon Studies website or on the announcement of this fireside. And please share this link with your friends and family. Our opening prayer tonight will be given by David Golding, a graduate of Claremont Graduate University and an early participant in the Mormon Studies Student Association, where he received his master's degree and his PhD in history of Christianity. He was one of the lucky ones to be Kate's colleague in the church history department since 2016, and had the great privilege of collaborating with her on a couple of events and projects. After the prayer, I will turn the screen over to Professor Matthew Bowman, the Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon Studies at Claremont Graduate University, who will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. 
There will be time for a few questions. So as you are listening, please type them into the Q&A box on your screen. David. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you, Christy. I am Matthew Bowman, the Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon Studies at Claremont Graduate University, and I will be hosting and moderating this event tonight. Um, and of course, I think as so many of us are, I am really mourning. Um, I knew Kate, and I'll, I'll say a few words about that. We worked together, um, and she meant a lot to me. Um, but I'm also at the same time that I'm in mourning. I'm glad to be here. One thing that I learned from Kate, um, one theme I think that really resonated throughout her funeral services and really throughout her life as well, is that it is the work of our lives to figure out how to live a whole life that contains both mourning and joy. How to reconcile these opposites, reconcile these paradoxes. And because we do that work, find a greater richness, a greater joy, and a greater faith in doing so. That is why I think Kate was a historian, uh, because she found in that work the great reward of reconciling that paradox, of embracing both pain and joy, and finding a deeper sense of who she was and who we all are um, in doing so. Kate was born in Santa Barbara, California. She served a mission in Russia. She earned degrees from Brigham Young University, from Harvard Divinity School, and Boston University. And after she and her husband, Sam Brown, brought, brought their three daughters back to Utah, she became a historian at the Church History Department, uh, the first specialist in women's history there. Um, and that's when I met her. I actually first met Kate probably about 15 years ago when she organized a writing group. And I was really touched that she invited me to join it and a few other of her friends. Um, but I soon learned, I think, that that was really Kate's greatest gift. She was a fine scholar and a gifted writer, but she also shone the most when she built communities that extended what she sought to accomplish in her own work to other people, um, to bring other people into this process of becoming, of learning, of growing that she herself was really committed to. A few years after that, around, around 2012, she and I put on a conference together called Woman and Mormonism in Historical and Contemporary Perspectives. This brought together scholars, scholars of women in the LDS Church of all sorts. There were historians, there were psychologists, there were sociologists, but also we invited a number of just women in the church who could talk about their experiences with us. We learned from each other. We learned from the diverse perspectives that we brought um, to this event. And a few years later, that fireside became a book of essays that Kate and I edited together. And I was then, I think, really the beneficiary of her strong sense of what it means to be a scholar, her fine editorial eye, um, and I think the, the sort of graciousness that we can maybe only extend to people with whom we are trying to do a project. Kate really believed, as we talked about what the theme of this conference and this book of essays should be, she really wanted it to be the concept of agency. Agency of all sorts, how women in the church found and framed and exercised that concept. And early on, Kate shared with me something that her daughter Amelia said, and I'm quoting, agency is how we define and learn who we are. That's the epigraph to the book. And I've thought about it a lot over the last month. For Amelia and for Kate, the work of our lives is that process, that process of learning, that process of embracing what God, what this world, what each other have to offer. And we have all been given innumerable gifts that help us on that way. Faith, tradition, 
for Kate and for myself, the academy, and as the church teaches us, each other. We grow with each other. And that is why Kate loved history so much. She found people like Emmeline Wells, like Liza Snow, Art of Cap, Chek Okazaki, all of these people helped her discover who she was. And she wanted more than anything else to help us all discover who we are too. And she knew that that was a work that we had to do together. And that is the work we're going to do here tonight. We have here with us today, four people who worked closely with Kate, colleagues, friends, students, and we'll talk of course about Kate herself um, and the gift that she was. But we'll also talk about her vision, her loves, we'll do that work of lifting each other along the path that was so important to her herself. Um, so I want now to introduce our four people and um, then we'll have a, a little conversation. Um, Melissa Inoue is a senior lecturer in Asian Studies at the University of Auckland and she is a historian at the Church History Department as Kate was. She earned her degree in East Asian Languages and Civilizations from Harvard and her book China and the True Jesus uses a Pentecostal church founded in Beijing in 1917 to understand the history of modern China. She's also the author of a memoir, Crossings, a bald Asian American Latter-day Saint woman scholars ventures through life, death, cancer, and motherhood, not necessarily in that order. Jessica Nelson uh, joined the Joseph Smith Papers as a historian and documentary editor in 2018. Um, she has contributed to um, several volumes of the document series. She has degrees from Brigham Young University and Utah State University. And for her master's thesis, which she did at Utah State, she was awarded the best thesis award by the Mormon History Association in 2018. And she worked also at the Church History Department with Kate. Nicholas Shrum holds a bachelor's in American studies from BYU. Um, he also holds a degree from Yale and is now a PhD student at the University of Virginia. He also has worked at, as a research assistant at the Church History Department. Um, he's worked on projects on the history of the Young Women's Organization and the Diaries of Emmeline Wells with Kate. And Rosalind Franson Welch is a senior research fellow at the Maxwell Institute. Um, she works on Latter-day Saint scripture, theology and literature and holds a PhD in early modern English literature from the University of California, San Diego. Um, she is the author of Ether, A Brief Theological Introduction, and a lot of articles and chapters and reviews. All of these people, I think, really loved Kate dearly. And I am now going to um, ask each of them a few questions. We're going to discuss um, a few concepts and ideas about Kate's life, her work, her ideas, um, and hopefully have a conversation. So welcome, all of you. <laughs> um, I'd like to start by just having each of you tell us a little bit about your own relationship with Kate. How did you meet her? What, um, what did she mean to you? What sort of work did you do with her? And uh, we'll start with you, Nicholas. Um, and thank you, everybody. Um, it's really quite an honor to be um, here talking about Kate and this group. I know that she meant a lot to a lot of people, and she meant a lot to me. And so it just means a lot to uh, be with Aki about this. Um, just kind of the background that I have with Kate. Um, sorry if my internet connection is unstable. Zoom's letting me know. Um, I graduated from BYU in 2018 and was looking for um, something to do before I applied for graduate school and uh, was really going to um, extend an opportunity at the church history department. I had interned with the Joseph Smith papers and uh, met Kate Holbrook and Lisa Olson Tate uh, as a re to become a research assistant on um, an upcoming history of the Young Women's Organization. And so for the last four years, that's what I've been doing. Um, I've been able to do that very thankfully be able to do that um, remotely at times as I've pursued and completed a master's degree. And now I'm beginning a, a PhD and uh, just 
wonderful opportunity to work with Kate um, in that capacity. Um, so with the, the Young Women's Organization, did a lot of research and uh, preparing sources for source checking and wonderful lunch meetings, sitting down, talking with the group and uh, conducting in field research with oral histories. And um, as Jessica can attest, I think it's just, it was a wonderful, wonderful um, environment and group of people to work with. And it, Kate was a very large part of making that such a um, healthy um safe, inspiring group of people to work with. So that's just a little bit about how I got to start working with Kate. And uh, Nicholas, your video and audio is struggling a little bit. Why don't you turn off your uh, video and uh, we'll probably get your audio better in that way. Okay. I got that. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Jessica, go ahead. Hi, yes. Um... It is such a privilege to be here um, to talk about someone who means so much to me. And um, I, I just feel so honored to, um, to talk about her and, and what she's meant to me. Um, so I first met Kate actually as a BYU student back in 2014, I was taking a women's history class and she introduced herself as someone who was working at the church history department in women's history. Um, that sort of aligns loosely with when she moved back to Utah and it recently started that job. Um, and so that was that was my first impression. She was there to speak to me uh, as, as in, our, in our class. And then um, I went on to get a master's degree and not knowing what I was going to do after finishing, um, I got an email from her um, in the summer, June of 2017. And she said, we have this internship. Um, we're working on young women's history. We would love uh, to know if you're interested. And I was just elated. Um, and so uh, I interviewed and, and got that position and worked there for a year uh, before joining the Joseph Smith Papers. And um, I just feel like I owe a lot to Kate for uh, that initial opportunity because so much of what I've been able to do with my career um, started from that first um, you know, interaction that we had, and she sort of brought me into the fold, and and over the years has has done a lot to introduce me to um, various scholars and um, kind of show me how to network. And uh, I'm I'm just really so grateful for all the ways that she sort of opened doors um, for me, and I know for Nicholas and for other people sort of in this station of of life of trying to. Um, you know, get our start. And um, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, like Nicholas mentioned, I enjoyed many uh, lunches over the years, uh, conversations over um, cafeteria salads. Uh, and um, I, I just, uh, it always just makes me smile thinking of uh, the wonderful things we got to talk about. Um, kind of as an aside about that, I, I know it'll it'll come up and it always does when we talk about Kate is how much she loved food and what it meant in her scholarship and in, um, just in the way that she uh, enacted her faith as a Latter-day Saint and, and her personal interests, sort of a lot of it aligned around food and um, knowing this about her and knowing a little bit about her taste, I was kind of surprised uh, at how much she liked Rand's dressing. <laughs> um, she, uh, if you know those little Dixie cups or, you know, that you fill a couple ounces with, I, I just remember that she would come to lunch and sit down with two ranch dressing things. And that <laughs> for some reason sort of surprised me, but it's always uh, something that, um, I don't know, it just re remained with me, I guess, that she liked ranch dressing as much as, uh, or more maybe than I thought. Um, and there are many other stories I could say, I guess I'll, I'll share one other one. Um, uh, so I guess when Kate and Sam were talking about moving back to Utah, some of the language they used was something about coming back to the mountains. And um, this isn't maybe widely publicized, but I know that Kate really did love the mountains. And in fact, she loved snowshoeing. And um, a week into sort of the pandemic or, or when we would align that with our timeline of when kind of things shut down, um, that it, right around mid-March, there was still some snow up uh, Big Cottonwood Canyon, and a few of us, uh, being res you know responsibly social distancing, um, got together and went snowshoeing with Kate, and that was so so fun, and I um, will always treasure that memory. So she really did love the mountains and love snowshoeing, and um, I just enjoyed her company so much. 
and rent stressing too. And, that's <laughs> and that, you know, that really, I think, speaks to something that, that she talked a lot about. And, you know, and it's true, you know, she loved food and food was such a, a vector for her um, in bonding with others, right? In doing this sort of thing of the sort of community building, right? Um, serving each other food, making each other food was so significant to her. But also, to the ranch dressing point, something she I remember having a long conversation with her about once was the lack of distinction between the sacred and the profane, right? The idea that something so common and simple as ranch dressing from a bottle when shared with somebody else could become the same way that in the sacrament water becomes a vehicle for the grace of God. Ranch dressing can become the vehicle for the building of Zion. Um, that's something she believed really profoundly. And, and and her ability, I think, to see that kind of beauty in something that costs $1.99 at Smith's, I think uh, is a marker of, of um, so many of her gifts. So thank you for that. Um, Rosalind. I, uh, I went back through my email to see if I could remember how I first met Kate. I couldn't quite remember. And my first email from her was inviting me, Matt, to um, chair a session at the conference that you organized with her. And I was looking at that correspondence. The reality is I have no memory of that. I have a terrible memory and I may just have forgotten. I don't remember if I was actually there. If you were there and you remember if I were there, please chat it because I, I would like to know. Um, but that was the that was how she first came onto my radar. Um, characteristically, she had read something that I had written, had seen something in that, um, and then had wanted to reach out and form a relationship, which was just the, the way that she operated, looking around for, um, for potential friends um, and then drawing them into her orbit and sharing the opportunities and the resources that she had with younger scholars. Um, and so that that is how I came into her orbit. For many years after that, I am not an historian. So I wasn't, you know, our our, our um, scholarly work really didn't um, touch each other very much. And so we didn't attend the same conferences. We were mostly friends on Facebook. And as has been alluded to, um, she would, we would exchange recipes. I, so as I was going through my emails, I have so many emails from her, I would put something out on, on Facebook, like a question about making bread, or in fact, a question about salads. And Jessica, I love that you brought that up because I have a recipe for buttermilk, lemon pepper salad dressing in my inbox from Kate, basically a homemade ranch. And I have to say, you guys, I, I don't think I would be a true friend if I if I didn't say I think she's rolling in her grave because <laughs> I'm sure she she ate ranch dressing and enjoyed it, but her homemade buttermilk lemon pepper salad dressing would have been so much better than a bottled ranch. Um, so we exchanged emails about recipes and about gardening. We both love to garden. Um, Kate was a famously orderly housekeeper and had a famously orderly garden. So we had a conversation once about a certain flower called the grape hyacinth, which will spread and become uncontrollable throughout your garden. And Kate could not abide that. Things were orderly in Kate's home and in her garden. And um, so she had meticulously pulled out all the grape hyacinth, as lovely as they are. They're very beautiful little purple flowers. Well, I am not nearly as meticulous. And I had actually invited grape hyacinth into my garden. So we started a little correspondence where I would share my pictures every time my grape hyacinth would bloom. I would take a picture and send it to her um, so that she could enjoy the beauty without having to deal with the messiness in her garden. Um, and we both we both thought that was a pretty good deal. Um, we finally began to um, interact more on a professional basis in about 2016 um, when Spencer Fluman drew us both into the orbit of the Maxwell Institute. So um, um, Kate and I both served on the advisory board and eventually both served on the imprint board there with our friend Melissa, who's here as well. So that is um, during that time I interacted with her professionally and was able to, again, see these same qualities of inclusiveness, of personal connection, um, of patience and persistence in shepherding projects through in seeking out voices that need to be heard um, and in unselfishly devoting her considerable efforts to making other women's voices 
elevated and shine. Um, so we, I was blessed to interact with her um, quite extensively over these past few years in that capacity. Thank you. Yeah, you know, that that is something I think that we um, certainly was true for my initial interactions with her and following up. You know, she was writing and editing and doing volumes, but she also was organizing, um, gathering people together, sitting us around tables, right, putting things together. Um, one of the last emails I got from her was an invitation to an event um, six weeks ago. <laughs> and, and it's remarkable, I think, how important that work was to her and how much she continued to do it even up to the end. Um, Melissa. So I first met Kate um, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard College. I heard her give a talk in church and I was just completely impressed by how talks in church could be really interesting. It was like, it kind of blew my mind. And um, she was always on my radar screen after that. So Sam Brown, Kate's husband, I guess then boyfriend, um, was a member of the Harvard College community, and we were all in the university ward going to church in the Cambridge, um, the Longfellow Park building. So um, Kate was a kind of like, uh, you know, person I always looked up to as an undergraduate, um, you know, someone who I knew was smart and faithful, but I didn't really know her that well. Um, I think I got to know her better when we were, I, I also, Rosalind went back to my emails, like so figure when do we start um, emailing and it's actually hard to tell because we've changed so many email addresses, but um, I got to know Kate a lot better when we were both working on Latter-day Saint history, especially Mormon women's history. And, um, and, and then, uh, when I came to work at the church history department in 2019, Kate became my manager. So she was my boss as well as my friend, um, which was fun. And just one story that makes that kind of conveys the kind of boss that Kate was, was, um, in 2019, I believe, um, maybe early in, I think early in 2020, before the pandemic, but in the first year of 20, into 2020, there was an earthquake in Utah. Um, now, uh, you're all Californians, or not all of you, but many of you are Californians, and, you know, Rosalind's a Californian, and, and you know, so by California, and I grew up in California, so by California standards, this was not a very scary earthquake, but, um, but it was like an earthquake, and, you know, the house shook, and, um, you know, we were like mildly amused, um, but, but also like, uh, you know, it was, it was like really scary in, in many ways. And so, um, so Kate uh, emailed us like right after the earthquake, me and the other people that she managed, like Ryan Saltzgiver. And she said, um, are you okay? Um, you know, we, we, we were like trying to work, you know, in the aftermath of an earthquake, but it was kind of weird. Like, and um, he said, you know, I'm like here uh, with a child curled up in bed next to me. <laughs> <laughs> and um and he said I should probably have your phone numbers so that I can call you if something goes wrong um or you know something like this happens again so that I can be in touch and check in check in on you and I was like wow like Kate's my manager and she wants to check in on me in an earthquake and like and also like a kind of touchingly personal um thing you know here I was trying to like I just started working for Kate so I was trying to be very professional, you know, show how like efficient and effective I was, but she like shares this detail, you know, I'm here and like a kid is curled up in bed next to me, you know, and, and like, how are you doing? And, and that was just, you know, so Kate, very, very human. Um, she went to the, the places where, um, you know, we don't always go like, you know, sharing personal, um, sharing the kind of informal personal aspects of life when she thought, that they would make you um, feel comfortable in the way that she thought you needed to feel comfortable. She was actually a very private person, um, but she would be personal when um, when she saw that you needed that or she thought that you needed that. So that's a fun story about Kate's managerial style. No, and it, it speaks, I think, to yeah, I, I, what you say is true, right? She was she was an introvert. Um, <laughs> she was shy, but she was also deeply, deeply warm and caring. Um, and those two things, I think, were really compatible in her. And and I, I'm just remembering something her daughter said at the funeral, that it was um, uh, that her mother was not perfect, but her mother worked so hard to be good and to be kind. And that's better than being perfect. Um, the kind of commitment she made to reach out to others, to build relationships, to be kind. Um, and to you know, hold her hand out even when it didn't come naturally to her. Um, as another introvert, that's something that really speaks to me, and I think makes me want to be better. And and one thing Kate was very good at was making, at least me, want to be a better person. Um, as well, that may be true for all of you as well. 
Uh, Matt, can I add something to that? Yeah, please do. Um, so one thing that I really loved and respected about Kate is, uh, and you just kind of alluded to it in, in your comment, um, is that uh, I don't think she would say that she was maybe naturally a great writer, though she was a great writer. She put a lot of effort into the craft, into working on it. And that was something that she sort of passed down to me um, as like someone who had worked for her, but she thought about ways that I could improve my writing. And so she would recommend books or bring me into writing groups or let me in into a little, give me insights on onto a little bit more of the process. And that was something that she continually worked on. And so I think that sort of shows a little bit more, like you say about um, the, the effort and intention that went into what she did, as well as the relationships that that, that that involved. And so I was grateful that I was someone she thought of for those opportunities. And um, it really modeled to me that uh, what the writing process could look like, that it's not, it's not always easy for everyone, or it's not easy actually probably for most people, even if they make it look easy, but um, it's something that you could work at and that it, it's a skill that can be acquired. Um, and that's something that I really, really respected about Kate. No, that's so true. And, and and it's fascinating to me is, you know, we think of writing as being maybe the ultimate solitary work, the thing you do by yourself in a room with a closed door, and she found a way to make it something communal. Um, I, I'm delighted to hear you were also in a Kate writing group. Um, I wonder how many of us were, um, even if we didn't know it of each other. <laughs> um, let's talk a bit now about um, well, we've talked a bit about Kate as a person. I'm interested in talking about her work now. And that might be, right, her her published work, the volume she worked on, but it might also be also um, this sort of work, right? The work of, of community building, of organizing, and that sort of thing. And I wonder if each of you might say a bit about that. Um, what struck you about her work? What did you find valuable or useful or important about it? Um, Nicholas, why don't we start with you? Yeah, thank you. And please let me know if my audio doesn't come through well. I, I'm not sure that I would be able to speak uh, particularly well to her published scholarship um, as much, whether that's articles or um, I wasn't totally attuned to Mormon studies or Mormon history at the time that things like First 50 Years and At the Pulpit came out. Uh, I can definitely speak to its influence now, but I think to your the point that you made about how she built community and how she brought a very uh, quiet confidence to what she was uh, attempting to do with 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 her scholarship. Um, one of the themes at her funeral that really came through for me was uh, she didn't do things with a lot of fanfare. She didn't need it. Um, I think she was. Uh, I think she might have even had a little bit of a hard time with with uh, with the praise that came along with the amazing things that she did. Um, but that's not why she did it. It's not why she did it at all. So much of her work, work was um, reclaiming and, and bringing back these amazing stories and amazing individuals with a very human element to it, because just as she was trying to build communities of human beings and people that meant a lot to each other, she wanted to reclaim and bring back those aspects of people in history and how they had actual relationships with other people, not necessarily because they were the, the you know, the prominent leaders. It wasn't just because they were the Relief Society General President or the Young Women's General President. It was because of how they were humans and they worked through things and they figured things out and how they built their own faith and how they had a hard time with things in faith. Um, I don't know. I, I can't speak to whether that was um, something that Kate saw herself in with other people that she studied, but you could tell that she valued it and she appreciated it and she appreciated that with everybody. And so speaking about like how she looked at community in the contemporary, looking at people as individuals, which were people that she valued, um, she valued individuals and how they fit into a framework um, in the history that she was working on doing. So I, I would say that those are some of the things that came through as the most 
interesting and important and especially the way that she went about it as very, very humble and always listening and feeling like she was connecting with those people for the sake of connecting with those people and not because it got her somewhere, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, Nicholas, you know, as you're talking, um, it, it, it reminds me of how, you know, in the conversations I would have with her about the projects and the people in the past she was working on, how she would speak of them as in, in warm and friendly ways, you know, how you how you might speak with your friends who are alive right now, the people in, in the past were really um, people to her well rounded whole people um, with the same sort of um, concern and care that she expressed for her family and friends um, in life. So thank you for that. Uh, Jessica. Um, so I've kind of refreshed myself recently thinking about her work and I've read through some of the articles that she published, but one that um, really stands out to me is a, a Mormon Studies Review article that she authored about uh, the green jello pins that were created for the 2002 Olympics. And, um, you know, I mean, we're all familiar with the kind of cultural jokes about jello, and uh, we even may have, you know, teased people in our family about that. We, it's kind of just not taken very seriously. But, um, what I think her work does very well is take something that looks like a joke or that could be dismissed and say, actually, what you're looking at isn't jello or it's not just a loaf of bread. It actually represents so many more of these insightful things um, that involve women's lives and, um, and their intentions. It represents uh, resourcefulness and frugality. It represents intention and connection and community. And um, it represents uh ways that people enacted their faith in a sense because um like she talked about jello worked really well for church functions and so um you know she saw um the women's women's work their labor what they put into the the, the things that they did for uh for church meetings if it revolved involved food i know her writings like uh would pay close attention to details that um you know maybe like something like tablecloths or the menus were designed and they had this this thing and she would include that in her writing because it represented um women's work and contributions that she saw as valuable and so she dug beneath the surface in so many ways um with her work and it, and it gave it a lot of dignity and respect and i just have to say that that for me that that was really instructional and will shape the way that I look at women's contributions um, in, in the work that I do for the church history department that that will stay with me but also um, I found it to be very healing um, I guess and connected me with some of my Latter-day Saint ancestors and the women in my family because I saw them differently because of Kate's work if that makes sense like what 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 they did and how they lived their lives like it wasn't just, oh, you know, they were the primary president and they, you know, just did what they had to do and they knew the kids like treats and so they brought ice cream or something. It, it's so much more to me now, um, thanks to Kate's work. And um, I, I just will always love and respect her for that. And I think um, it has served, um, it, it served such a greater purpose, I guess. Um, in, in talking about Latter-day Saint women's history. And I think in, in the greater academic community as well, um, her, that, that's what she's known for. Um, and that's how uh, some of you know, our traditions and our faith gets represented through her works. And it, it, it just, um, it makes me so proud. And I'm, I'm so grateful that she was there to do it. And I hope that those of us who've been able to read her work can carry on some of that approach in what we do. Thank you. Yeah, you know that, uh... Of course, this is true of Mormon woman's history generally, and I think woman's history is a discipline generally, but something I think Kate really loved doing was excavating those sorts of stories that aren't remembered or aren't told and showing how significant and valuable and important they are. Even, you know, you, you brought up ranch dressing before, right? And now these little pins, right, that these small, tiny things are really meaningful. And, and if we look at them and treat them with, with the respect and the care that she did, they become really powerful to us. So Rosalind, 
Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, before I say my piece, I'll just add to that, Jessica, and underscore what you are saying. Um, Kate was never, ever prickly, but if she were ever to mildly, mildly rebuke somebody, I think it would be for precisely that, for dismissing as trivial or unimportant the life's work of another woman. Um, she was very sensitive to that and always um, made a point in her kind way if she saw that kind of dismissive treatment of a historical subject to correct it and say, um, this was their life. And if we see it through their eyes, then um, this matters. Um, Kate always studied what she loved, what was closest to her most intimate experience. Um, she studied food and she loved to cook and loved to eat. She studied and wrote about housework. And she famously had a beautifully clean house and worked with open about her own struggles in um, working with her husband through the division of labor in that home. She um, studied women's relationships and agency. And she grew up in a matriarchal household with a mother and a grandmother. So that was her, her, her most intimate experience. Um, and of course, she wrote about Latter-day Saint history, which for her was family history. And so often she approached Latter-day Saint history through the lens of her own family. I think if there's one exception to this, it might be in her dissertation, which I've just read for another project, but she wrote about the nation of Islam and its food ways um, at, in comparison to Latter-day Saint food ways. And I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure how she settled on the nation of Islam, and I don't know how close her personal association was with that community. So that might be the one exception to my rule. But for me, this is really interesting and it raises a question. And I'm a, I'm a philosopher and theologian, so you have to forgive me for getting a little philosophical here. But um, the question is, does one's love and investment in a particular object of study make us more or less reliable as an observer of it? Right. Um, and this is close to my heart because I work at the Maxwell Institute, where um, our focus is on disciple scholarship. Right. It's on the scholarships that's produced by people of faith from inside the tradition. So this is a really important question to me. <laughs> is this a fool's errand? Right. Or is this actually a, a, a fruitful way um, to, to seek, seek for truth? through faith. Um, does our faith enable or constrain our ability to see the truth? And of course, the answer is both, right? When we love something, that love gives us the patience and the curiosity and the loyalty to stick with questions through the long and meticulous and boring, sometimes agonizing work, archival work that she did as an historian to find the answers to these questions. Um, Kate had a real gift for long lasting relationships. And that was evident at her funeral where her childhood friends were still the ones that were closest to her in her last days. And I think that same loyalty and persistence is evident in her scholarship where she had the patience to stick with questions and subjects for long periods of time because she loved them. Um, it's I think it's interesting to compare Kate's account of Mormon women's agency, Latter-day Saint women's agency with somebody like John Krakauer who has no long lasting love or investment in the Latter-day Saint tradition, came in, did kind of a, a brief immersion and came out with, with his conclusions, which I think scholars have seen are, are substantially incorrect in a lot of ways. Versus Kate's approach to Latter-day Saint women's history, which was born of love, a deep immersion in the topic, a deep intimate acquaintance with the subjects. And it was precisely that love that enabled her to produce so much truth. There's another side, of course, which is, can our love blind us or can we be biased because we're so attached to our object of study? And this was a live question for Kate as well. I think about her, um, her presentation with Elder Cook at the Face to Faith, where she had to talk about polygamy. And that's hard when, you know, it's her own family history. And I think there are real questions there. Can somebody from within the tradition who loves the tradition give a full account of that historical experience? 
And I don't, I don't have the answers to those questions. Um, and Kate didn't actually reflect on them overtly very often. Um, she came out of a religious studies program, which has this kind of methodological neutrality towards its subjects. But then for the rest of her career was spent in church-sponsored institutions. And so um, her faith by design was front and center. Um, so she doesn't overtly think about this, the, 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 the problems and the promise of disciple scholarship, but I, but I see it latent in her work. And to me, it's one of the most interesting and important things about her body of work. Absolutely. I, I think that inside of seeing her work as family history is really telling and illuminating, um, and, and gives us, I think, a sense for what it means maybe to be a disciple scholar in the broader sense. In a sense, it is doing family history um, in all sorts of ways. And, and, and it, that opens up a door, I think, to, to consider the impact and the meaning of work. What is the work for? Um, which, and, and asking that methodological question you know, is asking about the results as much as it is asking about the method. Um, right, and we'll get to that in a moment, but I want to hear from you um, now, Melissa. Um, well, I was thinking about Kate the other day um, at, at a Maxwell Institute function where we were um, went to a restaurant, and I saw I thought about Kate's dissertation where she talks about um, this drink in a Mormon family cookbook. I think it's called the Mormon, yes, the Mormon family cookbook or something like that. And this recipe was for a rhubarb cocktail. And Kate said, you know, in her dissertation, she's like, well, why did they call it, why did this author call it a cocktail? Like it wasn't alcoholic. She could have called it like rhubarb delight or rhubarb surprise or rhubarb refreshment or something like that. But she called it a cocktail. And um, it was a drink that you could use um, to like use up the exuberant rhubarb at the end of the summer. So that points to the saint's frugality and also their aspirations to be recognized for their virtues. And she says um, this uh, focus on the, you know, the the choice of the word cocktail um, was to try to kind of achieve sophistication, to kind of try to um, align with the with the um, to, to assimilate in some ways to to show that you know we could be sophisticated too. We weren't just a bunch of Latter Day Saints weren't just a bunch of like you know hillbillies, um, but you know we we had like cocktails even though we didn't have alcohol or the kinds of things that usually make it a cocktail and. Um, I love how she was able to take something really simple, like a recipe and kind of speak a truth, which was that Latter-day Saints, um, in, instead of like being on this kind of pendulum that swings back and forth between retrenchment and assimilation, um, we do both at the same time. Um, both forces are at work at the same time. And uh, she saw that with the with the rhubarb cocktail, um, a, a recipe that shows the kind of, even at, at a time of so-called retrenchment, a time when the saints were trying to assimilate. So I think what Kate was really good at in her historical work was um, was seeing everything at the same time. You know, so often in scholarship, we're kind of pushed to pick one big idea and kind of prune everything else to reinforce that one big idea. But Kate was really good at without kind of losing focus, being able to say how, you know, two things can be happening at the same time and kind of capturing the complexity of the sources that she was looking at. So for all of you at home, um, I hope you're taking notes here. Um, the following things are important. Ranch dressing, jello pins, jello molds, and rhubarb cocktails. Um, I hope get a recipe for the rhubarb cocktails. Um, that we might share, <laughs> um, but I think these kind of yeah. yes, <laughs> look it up there. Um, but these two, I think, the last two comments, um, Rosalind's and Melissa's, get to I think what I, I like our final kind of thing we might ponder here might be. I think one reason why Kate took that job in the church history department um, is that she saw her work as being that of a disciple scholar. That is, her scholarship was not only to better our understanding of the past. It was not only a job for her. In a sense, it was a calling. She saw her work as doing something for her family, for her community, for this group of saints that she loved. She wanted her work to help us all, I think, find ways to become better saints. Um, and I wonder if you all might lastly just comment on that a bit. 
How did you see her doing that in her work, her life, um, the things she wrote, the things she organized, the food she made? Um, how did she help us be better Latter-day Saints? Uh, Nicholas. Yeah, thank you. I, I just thought of this experience that I had, this small anecdote of when my wife and I first moved to New Haven for her to begin her graduate degree and we were invited to give talks um, in in our new ward and i can't remember the talk i can't even remember the topic but i do remember thinking about well i can you know i can use some scriptures here and that would be really good let's say that the theme was gratitude and i have some scriptures i can use oh i guess i could quote a, a general conference talk that'd probably be good you know, how can I triangulate and bring all the authorities that one does in a talk? And I remember seeing on my um, shelf at the pulpit and thinking, that's a cool resource. I should look at that. And went to the index and whatever the topic was and found the perfect quote. And now I'm really sad. I don't remember what it was. The point is, is that it's a treasure trove of, of amazing things right go in there use it in your in in your your church works use it in your talks use it in these things but i remember using this quote in this talk and at the end of sacrament meeting this sister came up to me after sacrament meeting. it was like our second sunday in the ward and she said thank you so much for including um the voice of of a sister of a woman in the church in your talk. And okay, great. I'm so glad that I made the choice to include this in the talk, but the point was somebody and many people, including Kate and especially Kate, cared so much about centering and bringing to the front the experience, the unique perspective of women in the church because it is that important and has these wonderful resources and these uh, this ability that complete can completely shift the paradigm of how we think about canon, of how we think about um, tradition, how we think about um, intellectual history of the church. You know the things that we have passed down to any particular doctrine. Right? We think of well, it was this prophet, this prophet, this prophet, this apostle, this obscure man right but here in you have these sources and this process and i, I mentioned earlier of, of reclamation of you know kate going and seeing that these are women that embodied their faith they wrote about it and they cared about it and they shared it just like kate did and so that's just kind of a, a, a small example of how I, I feel like the things that kate did um it might have felt like a bureaucratic process at times for her but the end result can have really profound impact so that somebody that has maybe never come to church before hears somebody give a talk and is using really powerful spirit-filled words um, of the gospel of jesus christ through their experience and they can relate and there's a lot of power in that and Kate embodied that in all that she did. And on more than one occasion, I remember just sitting in her office. I needed a lot of help that first year that I was working with <laughs> the young women's history. Um, I didn't get in into any graduate programs that first year, and it was very disappointing and very discouraging. And she was the first person to always offer encouragement. And feeling like this was a very attuned, humble, just spirit-driven person that was able to offer the perfect advice because I honestly think that every day she was seeking how she could help somebody and how she could impart of the, the love and the compassion that she just brought to everything and sitting in her office and receiving that and just being like, that's exactly what I needed today. Um, so I'm forever grateful for Kate. I miss her very dearly, but I think that those are some of the ways that um, Latter-day Saints' lives can be enriched because of what Kate has done. Thank you for that. I love that image of uh, her 
in a sense, and going back to Rosalind's metaphor, right, of viewing the history of the church as the history of the family, and, and, and she is finding these relatives that we have not thought about enough, and bringing them to us and saying, look, listen, listen to what this woman has to say, listen to what your sister, your, your niece, your aunt has to tell you about being a saint, um, right, and, and, and that is such a gift, I think, to us, and helps us understand better, I think, what it means as we are pursuing our own paths um, there. Um, Jessica. Um, I really appreciate this question. And um, I think it, it really matters. And it, this question would matter to Kate because I think she took this, uh, this role as someone working for the institution and being someone that people look to as someone who studied women's history and as a faithful Latter-day Saint. Um, but also a, a great scholar. I, I think this is something that really mattered to her. And um, uh, in thinking about how to answer this question, an experience that I had or a memory came to mind, and that is uh, she sent me a, an email of, with a draft of an article that she was writing for uh, the Enzyme. And she said, tell me what you think. Let me know your thoughts. Does this make you want to go to church? And the end result, I'll, I'll drop the link to the article in the chat. It's called The Gift of Particip Participating in Church. And it's something that she and Sam uh, co-authored. And um, I was, you know, of course, honored that she wanted to know what I thought. But what struck me is that um, the tone and the way that she approached an article that she was going to write for the Enzyme is also the same tone that she uses and, and the approach that she takes to religious subjects when she's going to publish them. And so in other words, Kate didn't have different modes and didn't turn off the scholar mode to be a disciple. She did them both simultaneously and with integrity. And that is something that I will respect um, and honor about her, um, you know, in, in her memory forever. Um, it, it's, it's really um, aspire, like something I feel like I want to aspire to, to be better at and, and to model in the way that she did, that, that she didn't have different modes, like I said, and didn't turn one voice off to be another. She represented both things and in, in, in all the spaces that she occupied. And um, that's something that I, I really respect about her. And um, I think that the, I know that um, like when I was working with her on um, the Young Women's History Project and you know spending time in her office thinking about um, how to approach certain subjects and that sort of thing, um, uh, one of the chapters that she was working on when I was there was about um, Ardith Capp's presidency. And um, she paid very close attention to the amount of prayer and the seeking of personal revelation and that um, Ardith Capp sought in her position as the General Young Women's President. And I just know Kate wouldn't always speak to it, but I know that she did the same thing. She modeled the same thing that she saw um, Ardith Cap do in approaching her work with women, the young women's history and with all the work that she did. Um, and yeah, I mean, he was kind of a, a, a private person in a sense, but um, just being near her and, and watching her work, that is something, that is the impression that I got to have how much um, faith and personal inspiration and revelation that she saw in, in what she did, um, like how she saw um, Sister Ardith Cap doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, in a sense, right, I think uh, this is showing us, Kate showed us what it means to be a disciple scholar, how to kind of pursue, and I like what you said, Jessica, about not switching gears, right? How, how do we find meaning in our work? How do we make our work something that has meaning um, and pursuing it with that kind of diligence and looking to these people in the past for inspiration is, is a profound way to do that. Uh, go ahead, Rosalind. So this, this question of what her work meant and how it mattered actually was something that Kate talked about um, directly. She gave the annual Maxwell Institute lecture. Uh, Melissa, what year was it? 2020, 2020 I think, 2020. 2020. Yeah, right during the pandemic and Melissa introduced her. But her topic was legacy, right? She, she expressly pondered what is the meaning of our work? What's the meaning of our life's work? And to what end should it be aimed? Um, and if I understood what she was saying, she herself would say, 
So books are important, and I agree with Nicholas. Use them, know them, open them, love them. They're a treasure, um, and, and they're important. But ultimately, I don't think the books are the most important. I think she would say her most important work was the mentoring relationships that she sought that we've heard so much about from Jessica and Nicholas. Um, she, Kate was at the center of the community in so many ways, right? She, she was not at the margin, she was in the center, but she pulled off this amazing trick. She was at the center, but she was not insular. She was relentlessly expanding the borders of her community. And this is something that she shared with our friend, Melissa, who's here. Um, and, and both of them inspire me in that way. And so I, I want to, I just want to call out one way that I think was important to her in which she enriched our community. And that was by proactively building bridges with African-American Latter-day Saints and Black Latter-day Saints. And she made um, an effort to proactively reach out, to come to know them as individuals, to know their experience, to remember their experience, and to, um, and to bring their experience into the center of the Latter-day Saint experience. And in, in more recent years, she had turned her focus with Melissa toward global Latter-day Saints, right? And I don't know if, if Melissa might, might not bring it up, or maybe she is. Sorry if I'm scooping you, Melissa, but they have put together an incredibly important volume that will be appearing in a couple of months from the Maxwell Institute um, called Every Needful Thing. And they did just incredibly unselfish work in seeking out um, Latter-day Saint women scholars from all around the world professionals in their fields. And if you've ever edited a volume, you know what a beast that project is. I think there's 20 contributors, um, but this was a labor of love from the two of them. And in doing so, they have really, truly expanded the borders of Zion, right? They've created a new community of, of, of Latter-day Saint identity. Um, and, and that is something that will reverberate through our community perhaps even longer than the books themselves do. Wonderful. Melissa, why don't we just go to you um, to say a bit more about that? If you'll, uh, I prepared a very short set of slides to accompany what I'm going to say. Um, so I feel like um, this is a little facetious, but um, I feel like there's a kind of uh, ratio of hagiograph hagiography to action. Um, depending on how how young someone is when they die, and um, when you die, when someone dies young, we're allowed to say a little bit about how great they were, but because they're not here with us, it's more important for us to do what they would want us to do, to enact their vision in the world. So, um, for us, again, this is a little facetious. I just made these up. Um, the prescription is 25% hagiography, 75% action. So I'd like to give us three ways in which we can be more like Kate. Um, number one, be generous with credit. So Kate is hilarious. She she would like respond to me and say, that was a good email. Like I would write an email and she'd say, you know, I get an email back from Kate, good email. <laughs> like, who compliments people on their emails? Um, I, I found this um, time where she... Um, and this also means that you have to give credit when credit is possible, not when credit is due, when it's possible. She worked really hard to like um, find good things to say about things that, that people would say. Um, and, and she would take the time to do that. And it takes a lot of time. So um, for example, um, I had this, I, I came to her once as my manager, I'd had this bad experience. I had kind of like ripped through a draft that someone had sent me to read. And, and, and I, I, I was trying to be really efficient. You know, I, I didn't have much time. And so I, to, to help you the most, I will like find all the worst things about your manuscript and you'll love me because I'm finding the worst things and like I'm helping them to not get published. But, but as we all know, that doesn't go over very well. And, um, and it's actually not that helpful in like making people want to do what you ask them to do. And, and, and you know, I talked to Kate about this and like, to Kate, you know, help me fix this. And she's like, you know, it takes a lot of work to, to say the really positive things and to have the positive things outweigh the negative things. But yeah, it just takes a lot of work. And, and I, I, you know, Kate was the person who put in that kind of work. So this is just an example of this funny, um, she sent me an email she said like she wanted to credit me for um, something. Um, second, um, always say what needs to be said. So <clears throat> Kate, um, Kate was, um, Kate did have like many agendas. She was trying to get women's voices into history. She was trying to get, you know, change people's perspectives, change people's values about uh, women in the church and about how people thought about the work of women and so on. And so um, 
she always uh, not only would say things in meetings, but she would organize things. She would get together these groups, she would produce these volumes and she was really prepared. So for example, um, there was this time when I invited her to participate in a discussion group. And um, and she said, well, if we're going to do this, um, I want to make sure that the people, the women who are participating um, are like able to participate to, to their, you know, without a disadvantage. And she um, sent me this link to uh, good suggestions on fostering female participation in discussion settings. So she was prepared to kind of enact her agenda. And um, last of all, she would speak to people in a way that reflects who they're trying to be. Um, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich is called Kate a quiet revolutionary, meaning she was a revolutionary that the reactionaries love, meaning she was a revolutionary who loves the reactionaries. And it's hard to pull that off, but that's why she was so effective. And that's why she had so much trust is she, she truly loved people. And um, she didn't do things in, in bad faith. So um, uh, I just thought it was fun. Um, so I was trying to be like Kate. I told Kate I liked something that she did. Um, and she said, maybe you can work in the church history department someday. And it was prophetic. So um, I, yeah, that, those are the things that Kate taught us to be generous, to um, be prepared, be strategic. She could actually be very wily in, um, in getting things done. Um, she, she would like plot with me kind of behind the scenes before important meetings. Um, and then like in the meeting, like you would never think about Kate as plotting, but you know, she, she, she got things done. And then, um, last of all, um, if you want to be a revolutionary, you have to be a revolutionary, the reactionaries love, which means you have to love the reactionaries. That's beautiful, Melissa. Um, thank you. And I just love, you know, all, all we've heard from all three or all four of you on the on this question, I think, speaks to the same task that Kate felt she had, which was to make our family better, um, to improve our church, to build Zion, to make it what it needs to be. And the various ways that she went about doing this were really with maximum inclusivity. Right, Re always reaching out, reaching out, reaching out, embracing people and bringing them in. Um, I want to now, uh, in the remaining time we have, in the next ten minutes or so, allow all of you to participate, to ask questions if you'd like, um, to offer um, comments or maybe or maybe even thoughts and memories that you might have of Kate yourself. You'll see at the very um, bottom <coughs> of your screen a Q and A box. Um, and you can type, feel free to type um, thoughts, questions, ideas you might have in there. And going to uh, our first question, which came out uh, actually across a little while ago, I wonder if the rest of you might speak to the same things Melissa was speaking to here. That is, how did Kate get things done in ways that were kind and generous, but also effective? I wonder if any of the three of you might have stories um, about any of this. I'll jump in with something. Um, I was the chair of the National Institute Imprint Board until I came on to, into the Institute this summer, in which time I had to move out of that um, role. And so Kate stepped in, and this was at the end of her life, um, and she was already very ill, and I didn't know that um, at the time, but she graciously agreed to step into this role, and she chaired our most recent imprint board meeting. And Melissa will remember, it was a kind of tricky one. Um, so you're talking about some tricky meetings. There were some different opinions and there were some complicated issues. And I was nervous about it um, for a lot of reasons. Um, we, we had some Zoom trails as we always have, right? And one of our members, um, his, uh, his phone died. So he hopped on his daughter's phone. And so his name showed up as Clara at that point. And for the rest of the meeting with this gentle, gentle twinkle in her eyes, she referred to him the whole time as Clara. And it was just, first of all, a glimpse of her little mis mischievous humor, right? That twinkle in her eye. Um, but it lightened the mood. It lightened the mood. It kept things light. It reminded us that we are friends. Um, and um, and it was a good meeting. And we accomplished what we need to, what we needed to, and we resolved the, the tricky issues. Um, and, and everything turned out beautifully. And then in her sweet way that Melissa just alluded to right afterwards, she emailed me and said, Will you please mentor me on what I should do next? And so her her sweet little emails and her her commitment to this idea of mentoring and being mentored. Um, that's how she got things done. 
Wonderful. Um, yeah, you know, I, I had a similar experience with her as I was um, doing this this conference. It was tricky. It was very tricky. But, you know, there, there was, I think there were few better diplomats than Kate. And she was such a wonderful diplomat because she didn't really always try to be a diplomat. Um, she was a wonderful diplomat, I think, because she was generous and tried to be generous. And people responded to that. And as you said, Melissa, um, she loved the reactionaries, maybe not because, in part maybe because she had to, but also because she just did. Um, and that that is uh, that was one of the gifts I think she gave us. Uh, Jessica, go ahead. Yeah, um, like I sort of alluded to or mentioned with um, how she approached writing as a uh, you know, a, a skill, and, and that was something I felt like she was engaged in trying to improve um, throughout her work, even though she was a well-established and accomplished writer. Um, but I think uh, those of us who've, who've worked on her with projects would agree that she um, paid careful attention to um, organizational principles, like the what disciplines, other disciplines could teach us about how to better work together. Like she wasn't someone who's just like, oh, I'll just be, a, or I've been asked to be a manager. And so I'll, I'll do that, even though that's not what I'm trained to do. She took that sort of role very seriously and, and what kind of, she wanted to know what would make a manager successful and she sought that out and she implemented it. So I think she was aware of, and, and I guess Rosalind's kind of story there shows that too. She was um, aware of, um there are there are, are people that she could learn from other people and that there are um other disciplines and other uh folks with other skills that she could learn how to use and incorporate them and i always saw her trying to make these connections and make them work in in what she wanted to do and she thought that if 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 they could do that there would be better team synergy or that things could um be more efficient or you know they could meet deadlines and she wasn't um, hesitant in that because being productive and centering the work was important to her. Um, and so, yeah, like I mentioned with like this book, you should read it. This is how you can learn how to write better. She, she sought those kinds of things out. So if maybe I could chime in on that point as well. I remember, so she was always looking at how to write better. She always had a book open on her desk, how to write, a book, how to write an article, how to be, you know, more clear. Um, but what was so nice, and I would just agree with Rosalind and, and Jessica here, that she she wanted to learn how to be better with other people. And so I remember this, on this one occasion, I got an email from Kate asking what my address was in Connecticut. So I sent it to her. And a couple of days later, later I got a... Um, a package in the mail that was a book called how to receive feedback better or something along those lines and it was okay kate what are you trying to say because <laughs> i'm not sure what i'm supposed to have um what i'm supposed to take away from this but then she set up this like workshop group in our in our team where we all went through it together i mean all of us including kate and so it wasn't just this hey team you guys need to take a hint um you're not taking feedback properly or very well it was no i'm as you know speaking of Kate, i'm concerned about this this is something i want to be better about and i want you to be better at it too because it will help you and so let's do it together and that was that was definitely a kate thing in the workplace was we can do this together um we can figure out how to um, improve Over and over again, I think we were coming back to really this, this, I think, central talent she had and, and accomplishment she had of building communities and drawing people together and, and making us, um, I think, what the gospel teaches us we should be, um, which is a Zion community. And that, that came as naturally to her um, as I think it did to anybody I've ever met. Um, and it was inspiring, really, to see that come through her scholarship come through her work, um, and also, I think, come through the community she tried to build. Um, so I am grateful to our panelists um, to join us tonight um, to remember Kate. I'd like to once more, as we did at the beginning, um, invite you to contribute um, to the Kate Holbrook Scholarship Fund. Um,
I've put the link again in the chat. Um, it is, I think, a way we can all um, extend her legacy and do some of the work that was so important to her. Um, and in, hopefully, as we do it, to become the sort of person that she was always striving to be as well. Um, so we will close now um, with a closing prayer by uh, Katie Stevenson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are very grateful to have had this opportunity this evening to think about Kate and everything that she did to honor thee and thy son and uh, to lift up voices of others who love thee. We ask that thou will bless her family at this time uh, and her dear friends, that they will be able to always remember uh, special times with her and be inspired by her continually and we ask that thou bless each one of us to follow her lead and uh, being kind and in being uh, a wonderful disciple of Jesus Christ um, and we're so grateful again for this opportunity to join together and uh, we love thee and say these things in the name of Jesus Christ amen amen um, thank you all and again you can sign up um, in the links in the chat for emails about our future events have a good night.